Have you heard that eating and drinking bacteria is all the rage in the health world nowadays? That's right, bacteria. But hey, you may know them as probiotics. But what are probiotics anyways, and do you actually need one? And if so, how do you pick among all the ones on the store shelves nowadays? Well, I'm gonna answer those questions and more, so stay tuned. And what's up everybody, CW here again from Consider Health where I consider some of the big topics in health today. And today's topic is probiotics. Now the word probiotics breaks down into pro, which is for, or biota, which is life. Now so for life. Now this is absolutely apropos since we as human beings could not live or survive without these bacteria that live on us and inside of us. Now in our digestive tract, there are just as many bacteria, if not much more bacteria than we have cells in our body, leading some to joke that we may be more bacteria than human. But anyways, these bacteria are so important for our immune system, of which 70% of it resides in our gut. And these bacteria also make a lot of vitamins that we need, including vitamin K and a lot of the B vitamins. Now, there's increasingly more and more studies showing connections between the gut microbiome and mood and detoxification, regulation of hormones, weight and metabolism. So it's no wonder that there's such interest in probiotics and the gut bacteria. So having said all that, it leads to the question, do I need a probiotic? Does everybody? And the short answer, like with multivitamins, is no. Not everybody needs probiotics, but can people benefit? Absolutely, especially if you have certain health conditions. Now, I've included in the links below uh, some studies that have de detailed the conditions in which probiotics can be helpful for. Now, before you even go out and buy that probiotic though, I just wanna say this, lifestyle makes a huge difference in your gut microbiome. For example, exercise can change your gut microbiome in a matter of weeks. Also, how you manage your stress, how you sleep, and of course, how you eat, that all affects your gut microbiome. So if these things are being neglected or pushed to the wayside, I would definitely consider managing these things first before you kind of go into considering probiotics. Now some people ask, can I just get all my probiotics from eating yogurt? Well, a lot of these fermented foods, including yogurt and natto and kefir and kombucha and kimchi, they do have a lot of beneficial bacteria, but what it ultimately comes down to, as we're gonna talk about shortly, is the strain of bacteria and the strength of bacteria. Now, strain first, which is what type of bacteria. Now, not a lot of these fermented foods may be necessarily made with bacteria that have been shown to give human benefit, which technically is one of the criteria that classifies a bacteria as a probiotic or not. So if it doesn't have studies backing it, it may not be called a probiotic. Now, the other thing is with strength, and that usually comes down to survivability. When you eat a lot of these fermented foods, by the time it passes through your stomach acid and the first part of your small intestine where there's bile and pancreatic enzymes working on them, a lot of the bacteria may be killed, and so you won't get a lot of the benefit from the bacteria. And so again, as we're gonna see shortly, this is an issue with choosing a good probiotic as well, which leads us to this next topic. So how do you choose a good probiotic? Now before I answer that question, if you haven't yet smashed that like button and click the subscribe and notification bell, please do so, it'll help my channel out a lot and I really appreciate it. So the first most important thing is choosing one with a good strain. No, not eye strain or muscle strain, but what type of bacteria is in the probiotic? Now bacteria differ from one another more than apples and oranges differ from one another, so it's actually quite important to choose the right one. Most probiotics nowadays contain lactobacillus or bifidobacteria, and so you'll see those very commonly, but there's other ones with like streptococcus or saccharomyces. Now, with strain, you just gotta know that some are very well researched and others not much at all. And so, for example, let's take lactobacillus. Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, for example, is the most well-studied uh, probiotic out there, and there's a lot of evidence backing it for different conditions, like I mentioned earlier um, but there's other lactobacillus species that don't have much research and so by taking them we really don't know if they can be beneficial or not so again I would encourage you to look at the links below on the different strains that actually have been shown to have some type of benefit 
Now to the question, should you get a probiotic with just one strain or multiple? In general, I would say get one with multiple strains since one of the hallmarks of a healthy gut microbiome is microbial diversity. The more species in general, the better and healthier someone is. Especially if you look at people getting unhealthy, their microbial diversity tends to shrink. So taking a probiotic with multiple strains may help promote uh, more microbial diversity. Now what about strength? Probiotics are usually measured in CFUs or colony forming units. And you'll see products out there ranging from 1 billion up to like 450 billion. So how do you decide what strength to choose? Well, again, the answer depends on the strain of bacteria and what you're taking the probiotic for. So for example, someone with ulcerative colitis would benefit from a product like VSL number three, which is a combination of different subspecies of lactobacillus. Um, and that can go up to 450 billion CFUs. Now, someone with antibiotic associated diarrhea, for example, then may just need to take between one to five billion of Saccharomyces boulardii because that lower dose has been found to be sufficient for Saccharomyces. So again, depends on the strain. Now, what if you're just taking probiotics just for general wellness? Well, again, as a general rule, I would just say maybe take between 10 to 20 billion CFUs and that should be adequate. Now, refrigerated or not? You may hear certain companies advertise that their probiotics are better because theirs has to be refrigerated. Well, not quite. You see, probiotics are living microorganisms, they're bacteria, and they tend to die off over time, but especially as they're exposed to higher and higher temperatures. So what about at room temperature though? Well, there have been actually technologies developed such as freeze drying where certain probiotics are in a kind of a dormant state and they're not activated until they approach some moisture or some heat. So they're fairly shelf stable at room temperature. But again, it comes down to strain of bacteria. There are a number of strains of bacteria that are fully stable at room temperature, such as Bacillus coagulans or Saccharomyces boulardii. And so in those cases, those don't need to be refrigerated. But speaking of the issue of refrigeration, it's not usually a bad idea to put probiotics in the fridge because it may actually increase their viability and their shelf life. Now enteric coated or not? Well, like the refrigeration question, it's a matter of survivability, which then translates into efficacy. If bacteria can't make it into your intestines without dying, then you're gonna get limited benefits. So what manufacturers have done is they have put enteric coating on certain probiotics, or sometimes they've used something called microencapsulation to help them survive the trek through the stomach acid. Now, can this be beneficial? Absolutely. But again, it comes down to the strain of bacteria. There are certain strains of bacteria like Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG that I mentioned earlier, or Lactobacillus plantarum, or uh, Bacillus coagulans that actually don't need that. They can survive the stomach acid just fine. So when it comes to enteric coating, can it be beneficial for a different species of bacteria? Yes, it can. But is it make it a better probiotic? No, not necessarily. Now, should my probiotic contain prebiotics? So what prebiotics are is they are types of sugar or fiber that actually feed not just the bacteria from the probiotic capsule, but also your native gut bacteria. So in general, it's a good thing. But keep in mind that you also can get great prebiotics from certain foods. So a great diet can help provide lots of prebiotics. And just one note about prebiotics is that for some populations, it can cause a lot of bloating. So just be aware that if you get a lot of bloating with your probiotic, it sometimes may be the prebiotic. Now having talked about the benefits of probiotics and how to choose one, it leads to one more question, which is should anybody not be taking a probiotic? Well, in theory, those that have severe immunocompromise should be really careful or avoid taking it because they are live bacteria that theoretically can cause infection because their immune system is so weak. Now, this in the literature has only been shown a few handful of times where there may be a link between the probiotic and causing a systemic infection, but even that link is very, very questionable at best. So overwhelmingly, probiotics are safe for all populations. Now, there are certain uh, people with digestive issues like SIBO that may have to be careful with certain strains of probiotics because it can actually aggravate their symptoms. But again, there are safer strains that are SIBO friendly. So again, overall, probiotics are safe and not something most people have to worry about. So there you have it. Do you personally take a probiotic? And why or why not? 
What did you find most helpful about today's talk? Leave me a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. But until next time, be well.